my thinking in that moment was six months from now, I'm either going to be able to run 26.2 miles or I'm going to be six feet underground. Laura, thank you so much for being on the Soul Seeker podcast. Our good mutual friend, Bill G. Williams, aka Electric Bill, connected us. And you are a keynote speaker. I've watched you speak on YouTube and you are so dynamic. You have so many different things that you've done in your life. I'm really excited to have you here and unpack really your story and get into the depths of some of the darker times in your life, which we'll talk about maybe even the autoimmune disease that you experienced last year and all this type of stuff. But before we do, thank you so much for being here, Laura. Could you give the audience just a quick little overview of who you are and what you're about? My name is Laura Gassner Odding, and I get people unstuck. That's pretty much who I am. The longer version of that is that I'm the author of the book, Limitless, How to Ignore Everybody, Carve Your Own Path, and Live Your Best Life. And I make my living now as an author and a keynote speaker. Before that, I spent 20 years in executive search doing specifically mission-driven uh, organizational talent strategy. So helping people at universities, foundations, corporate, uh, socially responsible corporations, advocacy groups, uh, research organizations, find C-suite talents that they could scale and grow. And before that, I uh, was a political appointee in Bill Clinton's White House, and I helped create the National Service Program AmeriCorps, in which over a million young people have served in their community in exchange for college tuition. So I'm a bit of a serial entrepreneur in the political, nonprofit, corporates, and now um, thought leader space. I love it. And that just all of that right there, that would be enough for a few podcasts to dive into each of those different areas. But we'll get into your personal story. And I have a few questions for you. One is just, right, who doesn't want to get unstuck? Like, where did this start from? Where did that really foundational message of helping people unstuck uh, get be birthed from? Well, it's very funny. There's a, a speaker by the name of Judson Lapley. And Judson was, if you remember way back in the beginning of YouTube, there was this white dude at a college in Ohio who did um, the history of dance. And he like went through all the different dances, like all the way from the beginning, like doing the Lindy all the way to the Fox drive. And then he was doing, you know, like the running man, like all the dances, like within like a five minute period. I don't know if you remember that video it was the first viral video on YouTube. I happen to know him because he's a fellow speaker in the sort of speaker world that I'm in. And we were at an event together and he was introducing me and he was like, what's your intro? And I'm like, I don't know. My intro is like, she's a serial entrepreneur and she worked in the white house and she writes books. And he's like, that's boring. He's like, you know what you are? You are a punch in the face wrapped in a warm hug. And I was like, that's exactly what I am. And he's like, nobody ever leaves um, hanging out with you without feeling like they have lightning bolts in their veins. You just get people unstuck. You just move them forward. And I was like, that's what I do. I get people unstuck. So it actually came from somebody who knew me, but wasn't me. I think we all have a very hard time figuring out like who we are and turning that lens back on ourselves because we're carrying all this baggage of how everybody else from like our fourth grade teacher or a parent or a teacher or like the mean girl in school or like the head, you know, you know, football captain or whoever, all those people who like assigned all these things to us. And we can't figure out who we are. We don't see ourselves as today until somebody is just like, you know what? And they just see you so clearly. And so it actually came from Judson saying that I was a punch in the face wrapped in a warm hug. And then I get people unstuck and it's stuck. I it's love stuck. it. It's such a good story. So in part of uh, getting people unstuck is part of your process and message for people to find those those one or two or few people that know you so well, then it can be that mirror to help you get unstuck as your friend did for you. Yeah. I mean, I call those people your family, that combination mm -hmm. of friends and family. Like we all have family. Honest. Like when I left um, the White House, uh, my family thought I was crazy. Nobody leaves in the middle of first administration. Like, you know, you, you stay, like you, you stay, you cling to the Oval Office as long as you possibly can. Nobody leaves. And I left and I joined uh, one of the most successful search firms in the world doing exactly what I wanted to do. But I was there for like four or five years, really like learning from the best and the brightest about how to do this work exceptionally well. 
And then I had this moment of rage where I was like, I can do this better and smarter and faster and with more authenticity and more integrity and better for me and better for the mm. clients. And I walked into my boss's office and I was like, there is a better way. And he was like, there's the door. And he invited me to stay, but I had to keep doing things his way and that wasn't going to work. So I left. And again, my family was like, what are you crazy? Like you're at the marquee firm. What are you doing? So I founded my own firm and I ran my own firm for 15 years and I could have just hung out um, and just like collected paychecks for the rest of my life. But I was bored. I was done. I was like, I'd solved that puzzle. So I went to my business partner. I was like, I want an exit plan. And my family again was like, what are you doing? You're crazy. So every time I did this like crazy leap away from the thing that I was doing, which was safe and protected and made sense on paper, right? My family thought I was crazy because the last time my family saw me on a daily basis, I put the empty milk carton back in the refrigerator. I left dirty socks on the floor. Like I didn't have a fully formed frontal lobe. I was 17 years old the last time I lived in the same house as them. So I think a lot of times the people who are closest to us, our family members, actually don't know us that well. Mm -hmm. And it's the friends that we make along the way who we get to know. Like, you know, you said that we were introduced by Bill Williams, who was in Incredible. And the first time I met Bill Williams was right before I was going to go out on stage and give a talk to 2,500 people, the very first talk I was giving based on my book, Limitless. And he didn't even know me, but he saw me behind stage for a few minutes. He saw my speaker reel. Like he knew who I was today in this moment. He was like, Laura, you got this. You wrote this book. You're an expert. This message is what people need. You should go out there. You can crush it. And so I did. Because Bill wasn't a family member who saw me when I was 17 years old. And he wasn't like a friend that I made, you know, when I was like in high school or in college. Like we have to keep continuing to collect people throughout our lives who see the current us and see our potential and our promise and, and, and even the baggage that we're holding and tell us to drop it. So this group of family members, I think, are the ones that we have to have around us if we want to constantly be reflecting back onto ourselves, everything that we're capable of doing. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, for me, the word that comes up is Ohana, the Hawaiian um, yes. word for chosen family. Absolutely, and absolutely. And, you know, I, I, you know, so often I know uh, entrepreneurs who feel like, God, you know, if I, if I really am the person who I want to be, the people in my life won't really like me. They won't like the mm -hmm. real me, right? And the truth is they might not, but the harder truth is that their opinion probably shouldn't matter to you anymore. Well, yeah, I think this is such a big topic and it's, it's not just like family and friends. It's the way we show up in the world. And, you know, I noticed in your media kit, you had some things in like the post uh, pandemic COVID yes. era and everything. And all of that really resonated with me and it resonates with a lot of people, I'm sure. But one of the gifts that, you know, depending on who you hang out with, that we don't talk about as much in terms of the pandemic with respect to the devastation it's caused is the opportunity to slow down and yes. to go within. And as a result of that, now that we've been coming out of it on the other side, especially now with in the past month or so, masks being, uh, you don't need to wear masks at the airport. And I think just today at the time of recording this podcast, they announced in Canada, and I'm not sure if it's global. I don't know if you heard this, but travel res restrictions are being lifted. So we're really getting to that next tier in terms of June, 2022 of being in this post pandemic world. And what that means is we can't just go back to the way things were and the way that we showed up before we need to, however you felt back then, I see it all the time. And I'd be curious to hear from you if you're seeing in not just friends, family, colleagues, people, you know, or the outer world, but so many people, it almost feels like they forgot, you know, that they forgot the that, lessons they might've the learned or yeah. anything. Right. Because when we went within, we were all forced to go within in 2020 at the beginning of the lockdowns, right. In some capacity or another, and what you're talking about showing up and speaking your authentic truth and being who you truly are. I've noticed that so many people, it's just kind of like, oh, okay, I'm going to fit back into this mold because things are normal ish again. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, I have been asking people for, I guess, almost a year at this point when life goes back to normal is the normal you're going back to really the life you want. 
Mm. And for a lot of people, the answer is fucking no. But for some people, it's I cannot wait to go back to that. And, you know, look, you and I went internal during the pandemic, during the lockdown, but a lot of other people just watched to the end of Netflix, right? Like they watched everything they could possibly watch and they let it all wash over them. And the minute they could go back out, they did because it was easier, right? It was just easier to just continue on the path that you were on before because you knew it and it was familiar. And I think that if, if you were listening to this podcast and you have not been changed in some way, large or small, by the last two and a half years, you are not paying attention, right? I think that I think that every single one of us had an opportunity. And yes, it was a colossally tragic two and a half years. I mean, we lost people, we lost businesses, we lost, you know, income, we lost, you know, we lost a lot. A lot of us lost friendships, we lost family members, you know, I mean, it, it was pretty tough. And, you know, in the United States, of course, we had not just the pandemic, but we also had racial reckoning of Black Lives Matter. I know you had that uh, a bit in, in up in Canada also, but, you know, we had the 2020 election. I mean, it was like you couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting somebody that was, you know, having an issue here in the United States. And if you were not affected by that in some way, I mean, there's only so much Tiger King you can watch, right? At this oh certain God. point, right? I mean, and I watched it too. Like we all watched it, but at a certain point, y- you had to stop and say, what really matters to me, right? What really matters to me? And what am I going to prioritize? And who am I going to prioritize in my life? And, you know, for me, not only did I, did I have that experience and, you know, a little bit about me personally is that I, I have two sons, I have a husband and two sons and my sons were in 11th grade and ninth grade when the pandemic started. And now we're finishing freshman year of college and, and 11th grade. So we almost had this, like, I don't want to say I was grateful but I didn't mind having like a little extra stolen time with them. And for me, I spent a lot of time in those moments. Like if I'm going to get the stolen time, what do I want to make of it? Right. What am I going to do with this time? We have to make memories. We have to like, this is, I hope never going to happen again. So what do we do in this moment? And, and I don't know that everybody had that same experience, Sam. I think you and I, 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 maybe your listeners are like, of course we did. Cause they listened to this podcast, but I'm not sure that it was universal. No, you're right. Um, it was funny Which for is me. Disappointing. Exactly. For me, I, I mentioned this before we hit record, but I did ayahuasca in 2019. And I would say I was very out of balance in my archetypal energies of the masculine and feminine. And that manifested in being addicted to work and literally mm. chasing the dopamine hit and everything else. And then I found an amazing community and spiritual like mastermind and fellowship called fit for service by Aubrey Marcus. that I joined in January of 2020. So we had just gone to Tulum (laughs) for our first event at the end of January. And we came back and there was 150 of us. So we had this tight knit community and I spent the next two years going deep, deep, deep with like just these brothers and sisters going through these massive spiritual awakenings Mm. uh, amidst the pandemic as well. So I was very much like sheltered in my own bubble for sure of like people quote unquote doing the work. So I often do need to remember that. So thank you for uh, reminding me that because it's so true. And The other thing too is uh, distractions, right? Like I just watched, I'm out here in Santa Cruz, California, grew up a Warriors fan. I stopped watching sports in 2019-ish. And now I'm watching sports again because I'm in a different season of my life where now it's like doing the 3D normal human things again. And I had a few guys over from the men's group I lead and these guys don't watch sports. They're all doing like, like they never watch sports, but they're spiritual people, whatever. So we're sitting around watching the Warriors game in the NBA finals and just commercials. Even it's funny hearing the talk, like with people that are intentionally doing the work that haven't even watched TV at all in recent years, because if they are watching something, maybe it's a documentary documentary, maybe it's binging on Netflix or something else. But when most people, I don't want to generalize when some people watch TV these days, especially if you're quote unquote doing the work, you're not going to see the commercials. And it's interesting and very fascinating to go like down the rabbit hole of the inner work and then come back and then so clearly see the propaganda and conditioning and programming through it. Right. 
Absolutely. And the commercials are just, I mean, it's atrocious. It's just, it's loud and it's aggressive. And it's, you know, my entire book Limitless is based on this idea that we're all pursuing this idea of success that was handed to us by somebody else, right? Some external Mm -hmm. force. And boy, are those commercials, those commercials, even if they're commercials for a company that's showing you some like corporate social responsibility and they're, you know, they've got a same sex interracial couple who's doing climate change work. Like even then there's still the like, this is what's considered quote unquote cool, right? Like the product they're using or how they dress or words they use. And so even if you're somebody who's like, you know, on the, like, I'm not just like, you know, conspicuous capitalism, but I'm actually like a good, quote unquote, good person, good human there's still a definition of success that the world hands you. Like your hair should be like that, or you should use this product, or you should dress or wear those shoes, or you should, you know, exactly what size you should be or any of those things. Or even if the like same sex interracial marriage is the quote, cool thing, right? Like whatever the thing is, it's still, we still get influenced by all of these external forces that come at us and they come at us you know, I mean, I'm I'm also watching the NBA finals because I live in Boston. So oh, uh, last night was here. rough. Last night was rough, Um, but uh, hopefully by the time this airs, we'll be celebrating a victory. Probably not, but we'll hopefully be celebrating a victory. Um, But even those, I mean, the commercials, and it's not just that the commercials come on, the same commercials get repeated over and over and over. So you see, if you're watching one game, you'll see the same commercial like six times. That's insanity to me. It, it is. It absolutely is. But to switch gears, because I did want to get into your book, so I'm glad yeah. you brought that up. What is the, the title and subtitle of your book once more? It's called Limitless, How to Ignore Everybody, Carve Your Own Path, and Live Your Best Life. Yes. Uh, how to Ignore Everybody and Carve Your Own Path and Live Your Best Life. That is an amazing subtitle. And in the last segment of what you were just talking about, you did say something about like the condition uh, idea of success. So I would love to hear from you kind of your story in terms of how you thought you were doing the things you were, and these are my words, but you you thought you were doing the things you were supposed to do or what success meant and then how that evolved for you to just sit there and be like, oh, this would feel different and then go on and do your own thing. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, my story started in fourth grade when a teacher was like, you know, Laura, you're a really argumentative young woman. You should be a lawyer. I was like, well, you're wrong, of course. Because, <laughs> you know, I was argumentative. So of course, I had to tell her she was wrong. But then I still put a path um, together, you know, at that time, subconsciously, obviously, I was in fourth grade, but I ended up in law school. And on the very first day of law school, I looked around and I was like, I've made a huge mistake. I don't know, this is that's not where I'm supposed to be. And <laughs> so, of course, I did what most young women who find themselves in, you know, unhappy situations do I dated like the world's worst boyfriend and the world's worst boyfriend who was a classmate of mine used to drive his IROC Z to campus which tells you everything you need to know about the world's worst boyfriend and he was giving me a ride home one day from campus and he was like I just want to stop this guy's office he's running for president we're gonna pick up some material because you know kids before the internet this is how you learned about you know where campaign you know candidates stood on issues and so we walk into this tiny um this tiny little office in Gainesville nowhere Florida and there's a little tiny black and white TV of then President Bill Clinton. And he's talking about this idea of service in exchange for, you know, a a, a college tuition. I was like, yes, amazing. That's it. I want to do that. So I dropped out of law school. I joined the campaign, started volunteering, ended up in the White House. Again, great. Ended up in the White House, helped create that program. And then again, sort of left, right? I had, was dating a different guy then, not the world's worst boyfriend, but a guy by the name of Alan, a nice Jewish boy. I mean, like he was in medical school. Sounds like my dad. Yeah, I mean, Jewish boy named Alan. Well, this Alan was a Jewish boy who was a medical student. He came from a great family. He had perfect teeth. He was six foot two. He was like the Holy Grail. And my grandmother, every time I would tell her the story of me and no spark Alan, as he became known in family lore, was like, I just, every time I kiss him, all I can think of is like milk, butter, cheese, eggs. I just think there's no spark. And she was like, you just need to concentrate. But concentrate as I might, no spark. So I break up with Alan. Um, I leave the White House. I go, you know, join this, uh, this search firm. And then again, I'm at that search firm. I'm there for five years. I'm learning how to do the work by the smartest people on earth. And it's also just not feeling right. I went there because I wanted to put my clients' missions first. 
And my boss was like, yeah, mission's great, but we got to put our profits first, profit first, mission second. And I was like, well, what if we put mission first and then profits came? And so at each one of those stages, somebody external from me, whether it was my fourth grade teacher or a parent or a grandparent or my boss, right? Or, you know, anybody along the way, those commercials on, you know, at, at, in the NBA finals, we have all these external influences that say, this is what makes a good job good. But nowhere along the way do they say, this is what makes a good job good for you. So when you're 15, 16, 17 years old, Sam, somebody probably handed you a list and said, this is what makes a good job good. Um, the leader, like how inspirational is the leader? What's the mission of the organization? Uh, how prestigious will it look on your resume? Uh, how much money are you going to make? Uh, how fancy is your office going to be? Um, how many skills are you going to learn? What's the next job you can get from it, right? There's like this list of what makes a good job good. But it, it, if you don't care about some of those things, and if those things are at the top of the list, you're not going to be that happy. And so the crucial step is that at 15, 16, 17 years old, when somebody says, pick a path, pick a major, pick a trade, pick a career, pick a college, and you go, okay. What you don't have at 15, 16, 17 years old is a frontal lobe, like the actual part of your brain that dictates good, sound, logical decision-making. And so you're asked to make this decision that's going to affect the very rest of your life before you literally have the brain capacity to make a good one. And so we look at that list of what makes a good job good, what makes a good life good, but we never actually prioritize it in order of what makes it good for us individually. So if you're someone who likes to buy lots of fancy things, you're going to want a job where you make a lot of money. If you're somebody who wants to travel to all kinds of amazing far places, you might want a job that pays you money, but you'll probably prioritize vacation time. If what you love to do is solve problems and figure things out, then learning might be your leading, you know, the, 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 like the leading thing on that list. And at every age and at every life stage, it's going to be different. So what I cared about when I dropped out of law school and joined that presidential campaign was not what I care about now. I'm a very different person. So, you know, back then I was happy to be paid in all the ramen soup and idealism I could eat. And now I'm, you know, 51 and I'm a princess and I like 800 thread count sheets. So sue me, right? I'm, I, I want to prioritize, you know, how much I'm earning. My kids are about, I'm about to be empty nesters. I want to make sure that I'm, you know, only traveling, only leaving the house when it is like an important client that I've got to be there and nobody else can do it. But we never stop along the way and give ourselves the grace to say, is that definition of success, that scorecard that I've been carrying around in my back pocket, is that my definition or is it somebody else's? And if it was my definition, is it still my definition? So again, at every age and at every life stage, maybe you've gotten married, maybe you have kids, maybe your kids, you're either gone or empty nesters, maybe there was a global pandemic, I don't know. At every age and at every life stage, it's going to change. So we have to keep checking in with ourselves and like you said, do the work to actually figure out if the thing that we are pursuing, that we are sacrificing everything else in our life for, we have to make sure that that's actually something that we want and not something that we've just been told that we want. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And hearing you speak, I'm like, oh, no wonder why Electric Bill connected us because that's <laughs> that's my James Bond story. I literally uh, uh, had a speech. Yes. Was it yesterday? Oh, two days ago. And um, that's exactly my story of achieving goal over goal and feeling more empty. And then finally, after doing the inner work, realizing that I was doing things I thought I was supposed to be doing to mm -hmm. be successful and it wasn't fulfilling. And what I've learned over these past few years, and this is what the mainstream needs, right, is to learn how to slow down and hear the whispers, right? Listen to nature, yes. see these synchronicities that some people call serendipitous moments, which I prefer to look at synchronicities a little bit different. They're kind of like miracles that align mm -hmm. and uh, almost like God winks, you know, uh, giving you uh, encouragement that you're going on the right path. And then it's starting to use discernment. And what I've learned over the past few years of changing from this masculine approach of do achieve, and this is the way that it's supposed to be and all that to now having a more feminine approach of slowing down and listening, but being able to put on the gas and the masculine when I hear those calls, right, is that th there's an accelerated pace at which the magic is unfolding, where sometimes I'm just like, 
I can't believe how all these things lined up and got me to this moment right now and how they all need to happen. And it, I could go back, you know, 10 years ago or whatever and see things throughout the years. And then I look at the past three years of when I intentionally did this and look at the accelerated uh, uh, approach to it. So for me, it's all about slowing down. You know, there's a ton of different ways to slow down. And that's kind of like what I talk about. But in terms of what you talk about, what do you recommend for people that are starting to feel like, oh, maybe this isn't life I want to live? Like, how can they do that sort of evaluation to course correct? Yeah. So what I talk about in Limitless is that we need to stop pursuing success as defined by everybody else external to us. And instead of that, pursue consonants. So mm-hmm. consonants is probably a word that a number of your listeners know, but it's not one that a lot of people know. We know it's opposite. We know dissonance, cacophony, um, you know, the sort of noise, the organ uh, failure rejection when you're just like, this just does not feel right, right? Like it's just, I don't know what's wrong, but this is not right. Consonants, on the other hand, is alignment. It's flow. It's harmony. It's when the best of what you do is being called upon to solve a problem at hand, a problem you actually care about. And you're being rewarded for solving that problem in some way that is meaningful to you. It could be financial, it could also be karmic, it could be emotional, it could be mental, it could be, you know, in any possible way, spiritual, it could be any way that you want to feel rewarded. So here's what happens. As a recruiter, um, I spent 20 years calling thousands of people who on paper were incredibly successful people top of their game, corner office, making the money, head, names and headlines, all the, all the things you're expecting to get. I'd call thousands of people because they were super successful, but all of those people would call me back because despite all this success, they weren't all that happy. And I was fascinated by this. And remember, I did this work specifically in universities, foundations, nonprofits, advocacy organizations, service organizations. So these are people who are super successful in quote unquote purpose jobs. And even they weren't happy. And so Mm. that to me was like a head scratch moment. Like if they're not happy and they have purpose and they have success, well, then the rest of us must be screwed, right? But it turns out that, and and I've now done three years of of pretty deep dive um, surveying with thousands of people on the internet about this in in pretty long, uh, pretty long assessment, which I can share with your audience, that people in nonprofit jobs and people in for-profit jobs have just as much purpose or have just as little purpose as the other. It doesn't matter. If you're somebody whose purpose is to buy a Maserati in a beach house and you're buying a Maserati in a beach house, you feel full of purpose. Awesome. If your purpose is to cure cancer and you're working on cancer trials, you feel full of purpose. It actually doesn't matter. So consonance is is not success as defined by other people. It's what your success is. And consonance is when what you do matches who you are. It means that you need four things. You need calling, connection, contribution, and control. So calling is that gravitational force. It's the thing that gets you up in the morning. It's the podcast you want to build. It's the book you want to write. It's the coaching program that you're running. It's the business that you want to build. It's the family you want to nurture. It's the cause that you want to solve, right? That is your calling. And again, if your calling is buying a Maserati in a beach house, that's awesome. But call me up. I'm at Hey LGO. I'll come visit. I bring good snacks. Um, So that's calling. Number two is connection. Connection answers the question, hey, Sam, if you didn't show up for work tomorrow, anybody notice? Anybody care? What's in your calendar, your email box, your to-do list? Do those things get you closer to solving that calling or do they bring you further from it? And we all want our work to connect in some way, right? Does your work connect to that calling that you just told me you care so much about? The third piece is contribution. So if connection is all about the work, contribution is really all about you. We want this work to contribute something to our lives. So is this work contributing to the type of life that you want to live, the lifestyle you'd like to enjoy, the, uh, the career trajectory that you want to have, the values you want to manifest on a daily basis? How does this work contribute? To that life that you're trying to build. And then last is control. How much personal agency do you have over the projects to which you're assigned, the teams that you do those projects on, the metrics by which your work is being measured, um, when you can work, how you work, you know, your hours, your location, can you be hybrid, can you be remote, do you have to go to the office? How much personal agency do you have? How much control do you have over how much that work connects to your calling and how much contributes 
to your life. And here's the thing, Sam, my definition is going to be different than your definition. But your definition today is also different than your definition was 10 years ago and your definition 10 years from now. And that's the grace part that I'm talking about, which is that you have to keep checking in on yourself. So if you said to me, I don't actually really need a whole lot of quote unquote calling because it doesn't really matter to me. It doesn't like, I don't have to have like a, a, a gravitational force, a higher purpose. No problem. I don't care. I just want to make a ton of money. And I want the only work that I do to be actually be like work that matters and is helping me move forward in my career. Cool. And I better be able to control all of it. I would like want to make sure I actually don't like nobody can assign anything to me that I don't want. And fine. If your job gives you no calling whatsoever, but it gives you tons of connection, contribution, and control, then you're in consonance. So you don't have to have all four of them. You just have to have as much or as little of each of the four as you personally want at this age and at this life stage. Yeah, I love it. And especially how you bring it all together at the end, realizing that we evolve and change. And it makes me think of um, Matthew McConaughey's Oscar winning his, his speech when he won an Oscar. And he's talking about how like he'll never chase his future or he'll never reach his future self. His future yes. self is always 10 years ahead. And yeah, very similar in terms of like what you're calling, your mission, your passions, whatever it is, that it is evolving. And that's part yes. of life and the human experience. And I think the people who did not change during the pandemic are the ones who don't mm. look back and say, what do I want now? What's different now? Am I evolving? Am I changing? They were just like, that was good before. This is uncomfortable. I just want to get back to that. Being uncomfortable is uncomfortable, right? Being like, uncomfortable is uncomfortable, but my next book is going to be called Wonder Hell. And it's about mm. that moment where you're like, oh my gosh, this is working. I'm finding a little bit of success. Somebody's buying a thing I want to sell. They're reading something that I'm writing. They're you're hiring me for something. Like, this is amazing. It's exciting. It's humbling. It's wonderful. And also, I've never been so damn tired in my entire life. I'm exhausted. I'm full of anxiety and uncertainty and identity shaking doubt and fear and envy and exhaustion, burnout, right? All of it. Like, it's kind of hell. It's kind of wonder hell. And wonder hell is the space in your psyche where the burden of your potential walks in and is like, hey, Sam, what you got for me? I bet you didn't know you could do this. And now that you do, you've seen a new potential of what you can do next. What are you going to do with this potential you didn't know you had last week, last month, last year? And here's the thing about Wonder Hell. It is deeply uncomfortable, but it is the only path to growth. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it is the paradox of yin and yang, right? How the mm -hmm. light feeds the dark and then dark feeds the light. And, you know, that, that's a whole nother subject. Thank you for sharing that too, Wonder Hell. Like, I, I love the name and the purpose behind that. But now... We will transition to last year. You mentioned that you had some health conditions last year, and that perhaps could have been a little bit of your wonder health. Could you speak to that a bit? Yeah. So, um, so last year, uh, I thought that we were like, you know, we're, we're getting there. The vaccinations on the horizon. Things are going to open back up. Like things are good, right? Everything's awesome. And then I started getting a rash all over my shoulders and my arms. And then that rash worked its way all the way down my body. And within three weeks, I had gone from um, having uh, six pack abs and, you know, weighing 128 pounds, I'm five, five and a half and a rower and a marathon runner. So I'm a fairly fit person. Which uh, by the way, real quick, you went from not being able to run a mile to a marathon runner and how long? Two, uh, two years. It was, I, I ran my first mile ever of my entire life when I was 39 years old. And then when I was 41, I ran both the Boston and the Chicago marathons. Worth noting. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Amazing. kind of an all in sort of gal. Yeah. Um, and uh, which actually is hilarious because my doctors with this autoimmune disease are like, you know, only you would like go big with this. So within three weeks, I went from weighing like 128 pounds to weighing 142 pounds and my entire body from head to toe, like you couldn't, you could barely even see my eyes. I was so swollen, let alone like six pack abs. Like it was just, I was unrecognizable. I could not wear clothing. I couldn't um, put shoes on. I could barely walk. I, my hands and my fingernails were peeling off. I couldn't open jars. I mean, it was like my body, I looked like I was a noble victim. My body uh, was basically eating itself from the outside. And this autoimmune disease called pityriasis rubra polaris, say that three times fast, 
it affects 800 people in the entirety of the United States. And I live in Boston, which is like the center of the medical universe. So it, it took three months to get a diagnosis, but it only took three months, which is kind of miraculous. And one of the world's leading specialists on this bizarro disease happens to practice like 15 minutes from my house. And I walked into his office the first time I met him and I stripped down naked and he looked at me and he was like, yep, that's PRP. He was the first doctor who didn't look at me naked and go, ah, hmm. Which, by the way, when you're 50 years old, is not the kind of wow you want when you strip down naked in front of somebody. So I was like, you've seen this? And he's like, yep, that's PRP. And I was like, I'm like, come on, man, really? I mean, 800 people in the entirety of the United States? Like, I'm special. I'm not that special. And he looks at his clipboard with like zero affect whatsoever. And he's like, well, according to the 32 blood tests, the chest x-ray and the four biopsies you had, it would appear that you are this way to the chemotherapy infusion room. And, and then I spent um, eight months on chemotherapy infusions, uh, an off-label usage of like a failed cancer drug um, because there's no test, there's no treatment, there's no cure for this crazy thing because nobody has it. Uh, and they were like, fingers crossed, we'll see what happens. Who knows? And um, as of two months ago, I'm in remission, which is amazing. But I will tell you that there were moments in 2021 that I would not have bet even a little bit of money on the fact that I'd be sitting here talking to you today. This disease does not, it's not life-threatening, but it is quality of life threatening such that the suicide rate on it is Mm. fairly, fairly high. And um, most people do not have the incredible privilege that I have to be living in Boston and have access to the doctors that I had and have a doctor that's willing to say, here, this drug causes a stroke and 40% of patients and death in the other 20%, but you want it? I was like, where do I sign up? I was like, it was that bad. I laid in bed for probably two to three hours every night for two months straight, wide awake in the middle of the night, making mental lists to myself of the videos that I wanted to make to my, my children. Wow. When they graduate from college, when they walk down the aisle, when they have their first children, I just, the only thing I knew for sure was that if we couldn't figure out what this was, I couldn't live with it. And if, when we did figure out what it was, if the drugs didn't work, I couldn't live with it. And I have healthy children, a happy marriage, thriving business. I have everything in the world to live for. And I would not have been able to live through this. And looking back on it, I am not somebody who was prone to anxiety or depression. I do not have anxiety, capital A or depression, capital D, but I can tell you that I had anxiety and I was depressed, right? Like the effect that it has on you, because when your body experiences 20 pounds of inflammation in the course of three weeks, your brain does the same thing. Plus you're Mm. also not sleeping. It's affecting every organ in your body. Everything is inflamed. And I, um, I was, I was not myself at all. And now that I'm in remission, I I went to a psychiatrist earlier uh, this, this year, once I'd sort of gone off of the chemotherapy drugs. And I knew that from the neck down, I was fine. (laughs) My body was like, okay, neck up. You got to go figure out what the hell just happened to you. And I went to go see a psychiatrist and I was like, dude, I don't understand what's wrong. I know that I'm fine. Like logically, like I know, I know that I'm fine. And he's like, yes. And now you have PTSD. Like now you need to deal with the trauma of your, because there's, he said, there's two types of people in the world. There's the type who fall apart in a crisis. And then the kind who fall apart after crisis. It's like the second group is stronger, obviously. He's like, but it doesn't mean that you don't have to deal with the crisis. Like, so now you got to deal with the crisis. And so I actually ended up doing ketamine therapy, which I will tell you. I know a lot you, about that. Oh my God. I will tell you. It was life changing. When he first was like ketamine, I was like ketamine, like vitamin K from like the '80s club kids. Like, now what are you talking about? He's like, no, 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 totally different. So I did like the nasal, you know, the nasal spray, and it was life changing. Like I, I walked into his office after seeing him for a year, like throughout like the whole sickness, and I walked into his office and I was like, hi. He's like, what's cooking? I was like, me with gas, like on every burner. I didn't realize that only my like left back burner was kind of sometimes only on Wednesdays working and the rest were, the pilot lights were off until now. 
And I was like, and if you'd never met me before, you'd think I was like a manic depressive. And I was like in a manic moment because I was like so up. And I'm like, this is just me. Like I have life force. And he's like, it's a pleasure to finally meet you. <laughs> and that's kind of how I feel like after a year and a half. And then, you know, the, the two years before that, you know, with the, with, or the year before that with the pandemic and going all the way back actually to the marathon bombing in Boston mm. in 2013, I didn't realize that I'd been carrying around so much weight and so much trauma all this time. And that's really what it feels like. It's like, it's great to meet you. Here I am. Like I'm back. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing all of that. It's and a long story. <laughs> Ah, that was like the short version, the cliff notes, right? <laughs> yes, I mean, yeah. I have so many questions there. And the first is kind of your mental state as you were healing, because you did mention that you would go, I can't even imagine what that would be like to lie in bed for two or three hours a night and think about the videos that you would leave for your children, not knowing if you're going to be there for their special moments, or, or even if you were there to be in the full expression of who you are, right? Yes. So I'm a big fan of Dr. Joe. Are you familiar with Dr. Joe Dispenza? Oh, Ooh. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So it's kind of like the Rainmaker story. The Rainmaker story is essentially that the outer world we experience with our five senses is a reflection of our inner world. So it's it, the way society is structured, unfortunately, and we kind of touched on this earlier with the programming, is to keep us in a limited state. So when one does get sick and has everything going on throughout society, whether it's fear of money, fear of being, uh, will I ever, ever be healthy again, or a doctor telling you that your odds aren't good, all this type of stuff. There is so much quote unquote negativity coming in. Mm -hmm. And if you fall victim to that, then I, I personally believe that's where, you know, you, if you didn't, if you fell victim, then we wouldn't be having this conversation. So my sure. question for you is like, how were you able to maintain that inner strength? You know, I, if I'm being completely honest, I don't know that I was. I mean, I, I did two things. As you mentioned, uh, as we talked about, I, I run marathons. I hadn't run a marathon since 2013. But, you know, like once you like walk, crawl, yeah. cartwheel, run across that finish line, and I definitely did a lot of walking across finish lines, you're a marathoner. Like they put a heat sheet around your shoulder and a, and a, and a medal around your neck, like you're a superhero, like you're a marathoner for the rest of your life. So in my, in my mind's eye, I had this identity of, I ran a marathon, I discovered rowing. I, I, I was rowing on a women's competitive team, you know, until my last book came out and then I was so busy on the book tour that I wasn't rowing. And then, you know, the pandemic, so I couldn't, uh, the boat has closed but I had this like, I'm an athlete mindset, right? I also knew that I wanted to write this next book, Wonder Health. So like, I'm an athlete, I'm a writer, I'm a speaker, but like events are not happening. So I can't do that, but I can write my next, book. this is a good time to write my next book. So I went in, as you said, like this way to the, you know, chemotherapy room, whatever I go down the hallway, they stick an IV in my arm. And a friend of mine texts me and she, this is the woman who I ran Chicago with in 2012. Uh, and then Boston again within 2014, she texts me and she says, um, hey, uh, because of the pandemic, the Boston Marathon this year is going to be in the fall. And it's going to be the 125th running. And it's the only time it's ever going to be the fall. It's going to be historic. We should do it. And I look at my arm and I look at, you know, the IV in my arm and I look at my feet, which are like covered in, you know, scales and 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 just peeling and like I could like I like walked into the office wearing flip flops because I couldn't put shoes on my feet. I mean it's just horrible. And I was like, yeah, we should. And I opened up a website and I signed up for a bib for the Boston Marathon because my thinking in that moment was six months from now I'm either going to be able to run twenty six point two miles or I'm going to be six feet underground. Mm. And there's probably not going to be anything between. And I did that. And because I did that, I like reclaimed some of my identity. And then I went home that afternoon and opened up a laptop and started a word document, wonderhell.com. And I just started writing. I started, you know, like as my feet started, like I started walking and then I eventually started running and I was writing and I was writing and I ended up running the Boston Marathon last year. And 
midway through the marathon, my stomach decided it didn't want to be in my body any longer. And I started, you know, visiting every porta potty along the way towards the end. Didn't get the run that I wanted. And I turned to my friend. I'm like, you know, New York is just a month away. We could just, if you're already fit, you don't got to get fit. We could do it. So we ran Boston and New York in September and in October of last year, right as I was finishing my final chemotherapy um, uh, infusions. And I'd be lying if I didn't say that at the end of Boston, even though my stomach was like, you know, basically empty at this point, I doubled over and started sobbing. Not because I was proud of my time, but because I just, I didn't know that I could be there in that moment. And at mile four weeks later, at mile four of the New York City Marathon, I actually tripped over my own two feet and I sprained my ankle and I ran the rest of that marathon. And I PR'd, by the way, Mm. um, on a sprained ankle. So, you know, they're like, I don't know that I was strong in that moment. I will also tell you that three weeks ago, I opened back up that Word doc, having not looked at it for like nine months, and I read through it from cover to cover, and it's terrible. (laughs) It's going to be great. But right now, it is just so bad um, because I didn't, my brain wasn't working, but I Mm. needed to do these things. Even though I was walking and I was trying to like run again, and even though I was writing, even though the writing was crap, I just needed to cling to this identity that I had before I became my disease. Because if I didn't, that would be my new identity, right? My new identity would be the disease and I'd be Mrs. Pitarias' Rubra Polaris. And, you know, that was not going anywhere but underground. So I I don't know. I've never been asked that question. And so my honest answer is, I don't know that I had the strength. I think I had to manufacture the strength. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that goes to show the power of having something to work towards, right? Yes. You know, I speak a lot about the masculine, and the feminine. And I can see it in you. We're similar in like that drive. And we have that very masculine, oh, I'm going to do this. And it's yes. very important for us to also have the feminine. In spiritual communities, I see it all the time where there's so many people, male or female, because it's not about your genitalia, but where they have that feminine archetypal energy, the yin energy, and it's like flow and this and that. And Mm -hmm. that's great too. I'm learning to be in that, but we need the masculine. And from a healing point of view, at least what I'm hearing from you is it's really tapping into that masculine energy of, I am working towards something and for something, right? And that, even though you already want to come out of it, of course, for your family, for yourself and everything else, like, it may not always be, I don't want to say enough, but like you have a physical tangible deadline now that you're working towards. Well, I was just so tired. I was so tired because I wasn't sleeping and I wasn't myself. And even just like trying to decide what we were going to have for dinner, let alone making dinner was just, it just, it just took every ounce of my, my being. So to have this thing that was which I, and I know it sounds crazy, like, okay, so you decide to run a marathon, but to have this thing that was like bigger than me, that was outside mm-hmm. of me, that if I didn't take seriously, I, like you can't cram for that test, right? You can't yeah. just show up the day before and be like, oh yeah, whoops, I forgot to run. Let me go for a jog today. Like it's like 16 to 18, 20 weeks of, you know, work. And, and I think having this thing that was bigger than life, it just, it just, it took me out of, what I think was a little bit of a pity party. And, and I don't, I do not want to say that anybody who's dealing with any sort of illness is in a pity party. But for me, I was definitely in a like, woe is me. This sucks. Everything sucks. I'm so sad. And so I'm going to answer my sadness by spending from one to four in the morning every night surfing the internet, WebMD, Googling symptoms and diseases. And by the way, that's a really bad idea. I <laughs> definitely not do that. So instead I was surfing from one to 4 a.m. marathon training plans and things like that. Like it just gave me something else to think about that felt more rooted in my core than this alien that I decided to take over. Not that aliens are bad, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> this yeah. alien was definitely bad. This was not a friendly one. Maybe it was a reptilian attachment. You never Well, know. I definitely look like a reptile, so it probably was. Interesting. So 
Yeah, it, that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier about Dr. Joe and the Rainmaker story of getting your inner world in order because it, the, it is a thing, whether it's an illness or not, and there's no judgment. It's just, it is, it just is, right? And it's <laughs> so easy for the narrative and the story to become woe is me or yes. I will never get past this. So for you to... It, at least this is what I'm hearing from you. Like one is like working towards this goal, but also filling your internal world with love and positivity and not the narrative of woe is me, you know? Absolutely. I mean, there's, it is very difficult to train for a thing without surrounding yourself with people who are thinking positive, who have a can-do spirit, who believe in the triumph of, you know, human potential and who are also hydrating and eating right and sleeping well, like all the things that we're supposed to be doing to take care of ourselves. So suddenly I had reignited my family to bring us back to the beginning, my family of people who get up early, exercise, win the day, own the day, have a bunch of protein, like build their muscles, like feel really good, hydrate like crazy and go to bed at 8 PM. Right. Like it was like, cool. Awesome. So if I woke up at one in the morning and I was awake from one to four because I was itching and I was in pain and I was uncomfortable, I'd already slept five hours. Like it was great. Like it was better than what I was doing before. So, you know, it reignited, you know, that group of people who helped me get back in touch with who I am when I am the very best version of myself. Now, you know, I, I have a, a woman on my mastermind, my work wife, Rahaf Harfush, who talks a lot about humane productivity and how we can actually do a lot of really great stuff without, you know, burning ourselves out all the time. And she's like, I hate the morning. The mornings are awful. Miracle mornings, forget about it. 5 a.m. club, no way. Like she will be, you know, doing her best work at like one in the morning, two in the morning, we mile one in the morning, two in the morning. Ah, nothing good is coming out of my computer then. It's all WebMD searches. So, you know, I think we have to figure out what's right for us, which, you know, goes back to you know, limitless, but we have to figure out what's right for us and figure out a way to create an ecosystem around us that brings the best out in us. Absolutely. And it makes me think too of like the doshas. Recently, I was looking at Ayurvedic stuff. And even if you're into like human design or anything, or I'm blanking right now of all these different um, ways of learning more about ourselves. it doesn't have to mm-hmm. be esoteric things, but we all are so different. And it's a good point in terms of your work life. Like it doesn't work for her to wake up early and everyone is so different. And that's just like kind of one thing we all need to realize it's cliche to say, but like take what works and leave the rest. Right. We can't just, there is no one formula. Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, I think that that's, that's where we get into trouble when we think that like, well, what works for them is going to work for me. I mean, even just think about diet. Like some people do great on keto. Some people do great on the Mediterranean diet. Some exactly. people are great vegans. Like everybody's body is unique to them. And, you know, I, I used to be able to eat tons of sugar and never have any issue. Now I have sugar and for days, my stomach hurts, right? Like yeah. even, even what works for us changes. So again, like every seven years or so, I think we have to stop and just say, this worked for me before. Does it work for me now? And if I am pursuing this thing, I mean, look, I think, I think the most important question we can ask ourselves is why? Why do I want this? Why is this important to me? Why am I getting up early? Why am I, you know, hitching my wagon to this person for the rest of my life? Like, why? And sometimes the answer might surprise you. Like, we have to sort of sit in that discomfort of, of the why. And, you know, it may be I'm doing it because I want to get the big bestseller accolade. I want to get the corner office. I want to make a lot of money. I want the fancy car. I want the fancy house. That's fine too. Like, I'm not here to purpose shame anyone. Like, that might be your why. Cool. Doesn't have to be my why, but if it's your why, all the more power to you. Absolutely, Laura. I want to be respectful of your time. So, thank you so much for sharing everything, all of your wisdom and your vulnerability and sharing your story of emerging from your wonder hell, as I'll call it. Uh, But yeah, thank you so much for the listeners. I am putting your social media links, your website and your book all in the show notes. Are there any other places or actions or final thoughts for the listeners you'd have? Yeah. So, you know, I talked about calling connection, contribution and control. And if you're trying to figure out what your own personal definition of consonance is, you can go to limitlessassessment.com. That's limitlessassessment.com. 
www.thepodcastmaker.com. And it's, it takes about 20 minutes. It's a fat, rather intense quiz, but it's your life. You should take it rather intensely, right? So um, if you take that quiz, it'll tell you exactly how much of each of the four of calling, connection, and contribution you have and how much of each of the four you want. And it'll give you some very easy, actionable today items that you can do to try to get yourself more in alignment and flow and harmony in your life. I love it. I'm definitely going to check out that assessment myself. I'll put it in the show notes. Laura, thank you so much for being here. I can't wait to see you on stage, maybe share stage with you one day. That'd be and great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam.